In the 1490s, an apparently new and terrifying disease spread throughout Italy in the wake of the invading French army. This disease had been contracted by the soldiers who were sleeping with prostitutes and camp followers, who in turn had earlier slept with mercenaries. One theory is that these mercenaries had brought the disease back with them from their voyages of discovery with Columbus, the Columban exchange of disease between old world and new. The new world generally got the worst of the deal. This new disease was dreadful in its manifestations. Pustules spread across the genitals and faces of the victims. They suffered intense agony. They had unbearable gastrointestinal pains and fevers, excruciating headaches. Their sinews were loosened and the bones were gnawed away. The new disease first appeared following the Battle of Fornavo, or at least that's when it's first described. And it's remarkable that a link was made between it and sexual contact right from the start. The disease known as the, was known as the pox after the pustules or pox, the pox marks from which the disease got its name. Well, pox could also mean smallpox, which also manifests itself with pustules and pox. However, the two diseases are very different. Syphilis was to hold up a mirror to civilization. It struck writers, musicians and painters. For a time, no self-respecting young libertine could uh, not be marked by it. It was a mark of fashion. And indeed, it was to influence fashion. Wigs and patches were used to cover up the marks of the pox. And indeed, you could say it was almost an occupational hazard for Renaissance princes, such, such as Cesare Borgia. It was a badge of courage. Later, it was also a source of pride for later writers like Baudelaire and de Maupassant. Indeed, the modern name for the disease comes from a poem by the physician Girolamo Fracastro, in which the shepherd Syphilis is a sufferer from the disease as a punishment for his sins. In its time, Fracastro's poem was praised as being the equivalent modern epic to such works as the Iliad and the Aeneid. Syphilis the Shepherd is uh, depicted in the 1664 painting by Luca Giordano, a Neapolitan painter, in his allegory of a youth tempted by the vices which is now in the Steidel Gallery in Frankfurt. When I visited to see the painting several years ago, it had just been returned from an exhibition and it was hidden away in a basement. 
despite being a massive canvas, the curator found it hard to find it. And then when we did locate it, it was necessary to squeeze up close next to the painting and see it at very close notice. Well, it's large, it's impressive, and it shows a, an attractive young man being assailed by temptation. Bacchus and the satyrs offer him one. Venus and Cupid tempt him with the charms of love. And Saturn looks on with the weight of the world on his back. Meanwhile, the Virgin Minerva tries to defend the young man's virtue. Venus squirts milk at him from her breast and the wind Minerva catches it in a bow. Now, this could be a reference to the fears that milk from syphilitic wet nurses could infect small infants. Meanwhile, the sinister, loathsome figure, the shepherd Syphilis, marked by the head with the characteristic flattened nose, with a dip in it, scabs, bumps on his forehead, alopecia. He reaches out to the unfortunate youth. In his mouth is a gnawed away bone, which is symbolic of the disease eating away the bones. Syphilis, the shepherd, is a warning of the results of giving in to the allurements of vice. And a warning that the beautiful youth could be reduced to such a hateful condition if he gives in to the temptations of vice. It's certainly a very powerful multi-layered picture. Now, an earlier representation of syphilis in art had been made by the Florentine artist Angelino Angelo Bronzino in 1545 in his allegory of Venus, Cupid, Folly and Time. It can be seen in the National Gallery in London. In the background is a figure traditionally identified as jealousy, which bears all the signs that jealousy suffers from syphilis, including patchy hair loss, reddened eyed, missing teeth, and bumps in his nose. Indeed, when I was researching the history of the pox, Syphilis watching in art galleries was almost compulsory for me and for friends. We would watch out for the funny noses, the missing teeth, the hair loss. Now, this painting by Bronzino is another admonition against lust and against the crime of incest, which is implicit in the main subject of the painting, the adolescent Cupid kissing and fondling his mother, Venus. The painting had been a gift from Bronzino's patron, Cosimo de Medici, to King Francis I of France. A king who was noted for his profligacy and for his uh, disreputable lifestyle, for which he paid with the suffering of syphilis. There are many other great works of art which depict syphilis. 
including uh, a series of paintings by Toulouse Lautrec, which show the inspection, medical inspection of prostitutes in a brothel. That dates from the 19th century. There's also in La Specola in Florence, a waxwork tableau of the effects of syphilis by Gaetano Giulio Sumbo, a Sicilian wax modeler. Now the Morbus Scalicus was for a long time hidden away in a cupboard. Its existence was censored and it was badly damaged in the 1966 floods that devastated the arch treasures of Florence. But this wax tableau strongly suggests, even in its damaged state, the misery inflicted by the pox with suppurating wounds and decaying bodies, a contorted and emaciated male torso suffers while dead female corpses lie on a rocky base amongst the skulls and bones of earlier victims. A baby suffering from hereditary syphilis looks down upon them all. The male figure, though, is the contorted and emaciated body of a man. His genitalia are covered with the typical sores and of the pox, and he has the damaged nose of the sufferer. It shows the impact syphilis had and the fear it caused. Yet the initial impact was there uh, soon to be lessened as generally what happened was the symptoms became milder. In the late 15th century syphilis had struck a virgin population. But as it became more common, so its symptoms were not such a killer as they once had been. But in the initial fear, there was a hysterical search for scapegoats on whom the pox could be blamed. Inevitably, women were blamed for spreading it. There was no idea that men could be guilty. And indeed, women were wrongly thought to suffer less from it than men. One idea about how to escape from catching the pox or to be cured of it was to sleep with a virgin. Indeed, there were cases tried in the law courts in the United Kingdom as late as the 19th century of men who had raped young girls because they wanted to use them as a scapegoat to pass on the disease and escape it themselves. Bathhouses public bathhouses had been common throughout Western Europe, but they were to be closed down as a source of moral and physical contagion. It reminds you of the reaction to the appearance of AIDS and HIV in the 1980s. There was just the same fear, the same irrationality. In the 16th century, there were two types of treatment, which generally corresponded with religious allegiance. The Catholic one was squiarchum, a treatment 
based on the wood from which it was believed that the true cross had been made. This was a wood found in Haiti from which it was widely believed syphilis had originated. And it was thought that the best cures were there where the illness was. God inflicted man and also provided the remedy, both in the same place. However, how could the true cross have been made of a wood that is found not in the Holy Land, but in a Caribbean island? That didn't stop Guiacum being imported for the treatment it suffers from syphilis and also was hung up in many churches. The crucifixes were made of the wood believed to be of the true cross. However, this was a Catholic treatment and was unacceptable to Protestants partly because its import into Europe was the monopoly of the Fugas, a dynasty of merchants from Augsburg, who had supported the Emperor Charles V in his bid for the Holy Roman Empire and had financially given their support. Instead, Protestants preferred treatment with mercury Indeed, it became a truism that a night with Venus led to a lifetime of mercury. It remained the standard treatment for several centuries. Then, when a new treatment, Salvasan, Paul Ehrlich's magic bullet, was found in 1909, it was based on an arsenical compound. It was only with the discovery of penicillin that there did at last seem to be a way of checking the disease. Ironically, this has made people much more blasé about syphilis. I think Alexander Fleming would have been bemused at the idea that his discovery led to the modern promiscuous sage and the permissive society. And there are periodic resurgences of the prevalence of syphilis. There might have been a treatment found for it, but it has not gone away. Well, I think I'll leave the last word to one of the reviewers of my own book, the pox, the life and near death of a very social disease. He wrote, after reading the book, casual sex will never feel the same again. <laughs>